Hello everyone and welcome to the third Wednesdays at noon session of the 2022-2023 academic year. Today I'm pleased to introduce Lloyd Acker, Teaching Professor of History in the College of Arts and Sciences, and Matthew Lyons, University Archivist, for the session Teaching with the Archives, the SRAM Company Records as a Case Study. Before we get started, I want to run through a few housekeeping items. First, we are recording this session and I will send a link to the video later this week so you can revisit the webinar at your convenience. We also ask that you stay muted throughout the session. You can enter questions in chat and we'll discuss at the end. As you all settle in, I wanted to mention a few upcoming events we have planned. Uh, firstly, Open Access Week is next week. We are excited to be hosting several in-person and virtual events that focus on the importance of providing free, open access to research and information. We also have three more Wednesdays at noon events scheduled for the fall term, including our next session on November 2nd, which will explore differences between using PubMed Medline and Ovid Medline search interfaces. Then on December 6th, we kick off our annual scholarship event series. This year, each of the three scholarship events will explore the theme of climate change and sustainability. I'll drop a link to our events calendar in the chat so you can read more about our, these exciting events, and we hope to see you there. And now if we're all set, I will turn it over to Matthew and Lloyd. Oh, thank you, uh, Rachel. Um, uh, Matthew, would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, sure. Yes, thank you, Rachel. Uh, so I'm Matthew Lyons. I'm University Archivist. And um, just want to say at the outset that um, this is a presentation about um, uh, instructional support from uh, archives. And that's an important part of my job and important part of the work that we do in university archives. Usually that takes the form of um, classroom visits and <clears throat> presentations and things like that. And this is kind of a different take on it. Go ahead, Lloyd. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Lloyd Ackard. I'm a teaching professor of history. Uh, I specialize in history of environmental sciences, ecology and Russian history. Um, and. Uh, I worked very much for almost my whole career, academic career with libraries, uh, especially at Yale University, where I was a, a fellow uh, in between the uh, libraries, special collections, and in the uh, history department there. So um, what we want to do in, in this presentation today is um, talk about a project that uh, Lloyd and I have been working on together for much of the last couple of years uh, as an example of using um, materials in the archives to give students an opportunity to learn about primary historical research. And um, that's uh, involved a number of different collections, but for today's session, we want to focus specifically on one particular collection that uh, has been used by a number of the students, and that's the records of the SRAM Manufacturing Company. Um, so Lloyd's gonna lead off and then I'll, I'll um, pick things up uh, uh, later in the presentation. Go ahead, Lloyd. Thanks, so, uh, so yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Matthew. And it's always been a pleasure to work with you and your team in the archives and the broader library uh, group. Um, so this project came from a, uh, uh, really based on a lot of, uh, uh, mentorship that I've done with students in the STARS program, independent studies, and then an occasional co-op um, working in different collections. But uh, as uh, Matthew said, this was a special uh, project um, that was inspired in part by uh, the Steinbright Career Development Center um, making a call for research co-ops driven by faculty during the pandemic uh, because the usual places that students work uh, were no really really no longer available, and so I developed the first was the SRAM collection. There were eight uh, openings in that, um, and I worked very closely with Alicia Donahoe, who was my uh, supervisor in, in Steinbright, and um, and so that's one part of it. Uh, this is really about how to use special collections to, in teaching, uh, whether it's in a research co-op like this or in a classroom, and what it's uh, really founded on. I think the special part of it is the unique materials that are located in the archival sources, things that students don't often uh, interact with. Uh, and of course, the SRAM collection, very large, very diverse, very unique um, uh, a set of materials uh, about this company. And, and you'll see a little bit more as I move forward. 
Uh, the process here is really complicated. And if you haven't done a research co-op or a, a co-op, it's really uh, kind of, it shows like the power of Drexel to offer students that cooperative education experience. Um, and so uh, the way you do it is you have three rounds of interview. First, you post your job or jobs, and then you have a round, three rounds of interviews, uh, A, B, and C round, uh, where you interview students and depending on how many show up, but I had 20 students apply for this job and decided to interview all of them because um, almost no one had uh, a historical background. They were all different majors from uh, mechanical engineering or biology or physics or uh, what have you, uh, health sciences. So um, so really, I, I did a lot of work just to get to meet everybody, give them that interview experience, and then eventually offered a number of people uh, the position. And they either accepted or rejected. And then you go to round two, round B, and then the same process. And then finally you're in round C and you fill up. I filled up all my spaces with uh, eight in the first uh, time we offered this, eight in the second time we offered it, and then four in the third time. Um, so uh, really uh, now you have your team and everybody's ready to go. Uh, I worked with them using a Teams uh, platform plus email and then uh, some in-person uh, conversations as the time went on. Um, but really the challenge was how to coordinate during the pandemic and later um, uh, uh, with the archives, how to coordinate with the archives during this time period. And, and, so, and then Matthew will talk about his perspective, but mine was really encouraging students to, uh, to, to stick with it. Uh, to set up times to uh, meet with people virtually and then occasionally uh, later on actually to go to the archive room. Um, and so just keep in mind that this was not the standard op way of operating where you have a group of people in a room, you all go to the archive together. And so it, we really had to uh, deal with this. Uh, the pictures here, you can see some of the materials that we're talking about where it comes from a publication uh, by SRAM or one of their brochures for selling air compressors and uh, from all the way through the 20th century. Uh, and as I said, the students really represented uh, a broad spectrum of uh, majors uh, and really no, or maybe one history major through the entire three years. Um, and, and I think the challenges are there is that, well, while they're all very intelligent and had some writing experience, they never really um, right, had written historical work. Uh, maybe one or two had a class at one point. So the goal for this is to really build skills, uh, skills that you can't get in um, a different, your, say your regular major courses. And that is especially about inter information literacy, how to locate sources for a project, how to evaluate those sources, and then to use them in developing a narrative based on them. Narratives can be written, they can be podcasts, they can be videos, they can be all sorts of media. But in this case, they were um, chapters of a uh, collect, co collaborative book. So it's a lot about reading, um, uh, excuse me, about writing, well, reading, of course, and then all about, especially about writing. And so students would do a proposal, an outline, and then eventually draft and draft and draft and draft until we finally got to the final version. Um, citations and how to cite work and how to find those sources are also really important. And here you can see a couple of the documents again. Uh, the middle one, the person next to the truck, is about the rotofoam, a, a material that SRAM developed to uh, for fire prevention and then also for, I think, really for fracking. Um, and then in the little grid you see, I have the eight students listed there, and you can see how they go through four steps of peer review. Um, this happened individually. It happened in uh, team sessions that we had, and then it would happen uh, sometimes individually, too, and through the team's um, uh, uh, shared documents. Um, and so that was really fun to do. And I think it was probably one of the most important moments in, in this kind of a project. Okay, so uh, let me pick it up now and uh, give you just a little bit of background about Drexel University Archives and where that fits in with this process. Um, University Archives is a program of Drexel University Libraries whose primary purpose is to document and share the history of Drexel University as an organization and as an intellectual community. We collect historical records of academic and administrative departments from across the university, as well as campus organizations. We also collect um, university related publications, memorabilia from students time on campus, 
faculty teaching materials and research files and various other things. And one of the areas we're um, interested in documenting better is Drexel's relationships with business, with industry and with the larger community more generally. And that's part of where SRAM's com SRAM comes in from our standpoint. Next slide, please. SRAM Incorporated is a medium-sized manufacturing company that's based in Westchester, PA. They started around 1900 as a family-run business, primarily making air compressors, and later switched their focus to heavy-duty drilling equipment. Since the early 20th century, SRAM has had a long-standing relationship with Drexel University. The company has hired many graduates of Drexel's engineering program, including as some of their uh, senior company leaders. They've also hosted numerous co-ops and at least one Drexel faculty member worked there part-time while teaching at Drexel. Next slide. In 2017, University Archives was contacted by Richard Schramm, former head of the company, to see if we might be interested in a donation of the company's historical records. From his description and my inspection, it was clear that their records were exceptionally rich in breadth and depth of documentation of business history, industrial history, and the history of technology. There's very strong documentation of equipment design and manufacturing, sales and marketing, company governance, employee relations, company culture, and lots more. So we came to a donation agreement. And in 2018, a couple of us drove out to Westchester and brought back a truckload of cartons full of company files. And with funds generously provided by Mr. Schramm, we hired a project archivist to organize the collection, transfer the records to archival boxes and folders, and write a detailed collection guide or finding aid to help researchers navigate the material. That work was completed in early 2020. Next slide. Archive staff was excited to make this collection available to researchers and specifically to work with Lloyd and the student researchers that he was recruiting. However, early 2020 was the start of the coronavirus pandemic. And so over the next year, we faced a lot of obstacles and challenges in helping the students do their research while also keeping people as safe as possible such as having to wait several months before any of us could even get access to the collection, and then having to limit the number of people in our small reading room. But there were also just the regular challenges of doing archival research. And these challenges are actually a useful learning experience for people who are new to this kind of research. The SRAM collection is stored off site, so students have to let us know in advance which boxes they want to use. Sometimes students needed help navigating the collection guide or figuring out which parts of the collection would be most helpful for their research topic or shifting their topic if their initial idea didn't turn out to have a lot of relevant material to support it. And we worked with the students on all of these kinds of issues. This process helped us as archivists get a clearer picture of the kinds of questions and difficulties that people face, what's straightforward and what's confusing about the process so that we can do a better job working with students and other researchers in future. Next slide. Uh, so thanks a lot for that, uh, uh, Matthew. Um, so the project uh, outcomes uh, is, and also the process here is that uh, we met every week as a group and then I would meet every, with everybody individually. Uh, this is while I was also teaching a full load and all the other things that I get involved in at Drexel. But uh, this was really the main, like, sort of main focus for uh, for my uh, extra time uh, is to work with these students carefully, mentor them through the week, answer questions, and then also coordinate with the archives. And I do remember going to the archives a couple of times uh, and looking at all the boxes that were out on the reading room table and just seeing that all the students had materials out, uh, laid out there. Um, and the goal here was for the students to contribute a chapter to a book. 
Um, and so we have a lot of collaboration going, students deciding the order of the different uh, chapters, how it fit into their, uh, how they thought a book should be organized, picking images for the uh, cover covers that you see here, uh, writing a, uh, well, for them, they felt a very important part of this was to thank and dedicate this book to the, uh, to the archivists, Matthew Lyons, Simon Rogovin, uh, Sarah Newhouse, and then also Jay Bott, who provided a lot of guidance in using um, the different materials of the library. It's not only about archives, but also the secondary scholarly sources that they needed to, um, to support that material. So uh, we were really quite happy with this work. Uh, it took a lot of time for organizing the book together and to think about what we can do with it. And really, after considering like publishing it out on in a in some kind of a um, you know a independent publisher, it really came down to like protecting the information, the student information. And I we're now considering how to publish it within the Drexel system, uh, digital archives of some kind. Um, and then the students also produced along the way a lot of social media an image plus a, um, some background about uh, them and this project and that specific image. Uh, and some of those were distributed on a variety of websites uh, in the Drexel system. Uh, and then also, I just wanna you know, point out that, you know, there was a lot else going on here. Um, and you can't always measure the impact of this kind of work, uh, but I've written num numerous letters of recommendation for these students who, are, who valued this kind of a project and moved on into the world. I have taken and used these materials in my classrooms too. So the products that they use and develop, I can use further on in classrooms uh, to teach with. Um, and, and really, uh, and uh, there's more coming and we're not sure exactly what it is, but uh, that's kind of exciting about it too. Now here you can see uh, the two covers for the two volumes that we produced, uh, some of the equipment that SRAM made. Um, and then well, one of the table of contents where you can really start to see the range of topics that match what Matthew said about the content material. It's about the technology. It's about the broader international context of developing drilling material during um, the oil uh, producing, uh, rise of the oil uh, petroleum industry to more um, social uh, aspects of gender and race in the SRAM company. And so I'll uh, move on here. Uh, and just one picture of the book, of the first book that we produced here, you can see just laid out there. I think it's kind of a, like so almost like a poster, right? Uh, and all the work that goes into something like that. Six months of writing and rewriting and research and discussing these topics comes to uh, this kind of an output. So concluding, um, we're looking forward now what we can do with this project. Uh, instead of having being a, uh, my own project that I ran through uh, in, with, with Steinbride and partnering with the library, the history department is now trying to figure out how we might uh, develop this in a broader way. That is, other faculty can mentor students, develop their own projects, uh, still focused on partnering with the library uh, in uh, university libraries, but also then the other kinds of special collections we have in the Drexel system at the Academy of Natural Sciences, the Legacy Center, Special Collection, and also the new Atwater Kent, and plus much more. Thank you. And um, from our standpoint in the archives, the, this project has helped uh, clarify our thinking around um, what we think of as teaching archival literacy. And the idea here is that, um, you know, whether we're talking about people in STEM disciplines or history majors themselves, um, you can't assume that people are gonna automatically know how to do uh, archival research. Um, and so this has really underscored for us the importance of giving students a grounding in just understanding how archives work, how an archival collection is organized, how to read a finding aid or collection guide, and, and how to be uh, prepared for some of the uncertainties and um, just kind of unpredictable nature of archival research. And these are um, uh, lessons and issues that have informed how we as archive staff talk with students and you know how we do classroom presentations and how we do research strategy interviews. So it's really been very enriching uh, in, in terms of helping us to do a better job of providing uh, support for uh, students and, and, and faculty and for the whole research community at Drexel. So it's been very rewarding in that regard. And I believe that uh, concludes our 
presentation at this point, and I think we can uh, go on to um, take some questions and answers, provide some answers if there are any. Sure. Just a final thing that I always, I really enjoyed working with you, Matthew, and your team, and also the other, uh, and Jay, and others in the library. So uh, thanks for, uh, for, for everything. Ah, likewise. I agree, um, Lloyd. I really enjoyed working with you all, especially the students and the archives. I personally had come to the archives a few times uh, and looking at the collections, um, and there's a, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a lot, many more ways that our faculty and students can engage with the archi archival collection in terms of uh, within the courses and within the curriculum. I think uh, we need to uh, um, make sure that our faculty members are aware of all these things that exist. Um, so reaching out to them and they also reaching out to us is also becoming critical in my ways, in my, in my views. And one thing I also noticed was uh, uh, students um, learn about the history of a particular concept that evolved so many, many years ago, and it's applied uh, into their own design or any other projects. Um, and that historical piece of information if you think from the engineering and science perspective, it is so critically important because today's uh, current students are not, uh, they're just seeing everything that is happening today. But how that stage has been reached, they have no idea uh, unless they really explore the history and the archives and uh, uh, background and conceptual understanding of the subject. And it's a great way to collaborate with so many different students from so many different disciplines. So fantastic experience, I must say. Thank you, Lloyd and Matthew and everyone in archives. And just to pick up on, on Jay's uh, comments there, it, 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 for us in university archives, um, exploring ways to make archival materials relevant if for, uh, STEM courses uh, in particular is something that we're very interested in exploring. I mean, it, it's, it has not been um, something that's been developed very much, at least at, at Drexel. And I think this there, as Jay says, there's a lot of potential there. And um, we've worked um, with him and others to look at some specific uh, materials and specific collections that lend themselves to that. And we would certainly uh, very much welcome uh, conversations with any other faculty members who would be interested in uh, exploring possibilities in this area. Yeah, and I, I just like to support uh, both of those uh, um, uh, comments in that, you know, if in the humanities, so in the history department, we teach a lot of courses uh, that are designed for like non-history majors, like technology and historical mm -hmm. perspective and, and many, many more, um, where you have a lot of people coming in from all different majors. And we use the archival materials in those classes. So, um, and, and to teach them how to find material in the archive, but then also to look inside those materials and spend some time trying to figure out what's happening. Um, and it's quite exciting because these students, like Jay said, you know, this is like the first time that they've got to do this and to help build that literacy around that. Like, how do you actually read something from 1890 um, in this company that's trying to make a living in Westchester? Uh, in Westchester has its own history, Philadelphia has its own history, and to put it into that context is, is really um, a great lesson um, that they can take back to their majors, right? And start thinking about, you know, mechanical engineering or <laughs> computer uh, information and, and, you know, and they, they don't forget it. Absolutely true. Very true. Like, and uh, you mentioned that you also teach history of science, history of technology courses, and I think those courses will also have many students from those disciplines. I, I as assume, right? No, for sure. Yeah, they. Um, yeah. Well, that's the challenge, though. If you have a large class. Um, it's, you have to find a way, I mean, to, to, to write the resources in a way, um, 
a bit limited. So if you can't, everybody starts taking all their students to the archives, we, you know, we have to find a way to work. No, that. that's what I was thinking. Uh, that's <laughs> what I was exactly thinking about, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, are they working on an individual project or they work on a group project? Uh, the, the students I have always do, do individual research projects, mm. but they, um, there is a collaborative part in that in the last two years, I developed virtual museum exhibits where the students would mm -hmm. take images and put them into a, um, it's called an art space, uh, art steps, art steps platform. And they would then uh, put the object there with a caption and then attach um, links to that. So it be, could, could be a really great uh, platform for um, student projects with, with archival material. Right. I do remember that sometime back, I used to have some students uh, who are looking for pattern from 100, 200 years ago about some piece of interest that they had. Mm -hmm. Historical uh, patterns. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Jay. I'll just add that I found like uh, the to build on the, the photography aspect and, and putting information with images. Uh, I found the, the photography in your uh, presentation really compelling. And I think that those uh, those images, even when they are of really old things, like an old, you know, uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, sorry, I'm not sure what the exact word is, but the like a sketch of an old uh, piece of engineering equipment, uh, you know, even just mm -hmm. seeing that on paper is really, or on the digital, screen it as you have it uh is really important and i think it's really compelling and it, it really gets people's interest yeah and there are there are thousands of photographs in the the shram collection alone not to speak of all the other collections that mm -hmm. we have okay. and um the chester county uh historical center actually has an even larger set of photographs from the shram records uh, some of the collection went went there um because of the chester county connection uh, so yeah, I agree. And, and there, there are many different ways that those kind of images can, can be used. I mean, in, in, in terms of the, you know, looking at the history of design or, you know, the, uh, the, the, the kinds of, um, uh, I mean, Lloyd referred earlier to the gender roles and just the, the history of, uh, different kinds of, um, uh, professions that, you know, men and women were, um, uh, holding within the company and how that changed at, at different points in history. So there's a lot there. Absolutely. A picture says a thousand words, right? Um, I see we have a question from Paige, uh, if we want to. Yeah. Talk to her. Hey there. Um, so my name is Paige Talbot, and I am the project director for the Atwater Kent Museum Project Evaluation. And um, as part of our project on behalf of Drexel and the city of Philadelphia, we are creating an online um, open access portal uh, that will include among other things, 45,000 uh, archival records and about the same number of photographic records, much of which pertains directly to the history of business and industry in Philadelphia. So we welcome uh, the opportunity to have that material join yours, um, there's lots of, of parallels. And while um, the question of hands-on access is still a little bit up in the air, the digital records will be there and, uh, and ultimately finding aids as well. Okay, Paige, if I could say that, um, uh, so from the history department, we're really looking forward to engaging those materials and have long awaited uh, the ability to get in there and get our hands on all these things. But or to look at them on, on the, uh, the digital collection. Um, they'd be really important to how we teach, how we do research, and, um, and not just in, in, the, in the categories you mentioned, but in the history of science and technology and medicine too. So um, really, and thanks a lot for that effort. And we're really looking forward to uh, working with you. Thanks, Lloyd. Well, there's plenty of all of it. So yeah. we can't wait for you to get at it. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi, Paige. Um, hi, hi. How are and, you, Matthew? I'm, I'm well. And uh, just to add that um, in University Archives, I think, you know, we would love to just have a more of a focused conversation with you about, you know, ways we can collaborate. I mean, it's really great to hear about your plans there. So Great. Uh, Great. Thank you, everyone. I don't see any other questions in chat. Uh, any any last minute questions or comments? Uh, feel free to uh, contact 
uh, me um, if anybody has um, questions about these projects. Uh, I did uh, do these with um, the same thing. I've um, had mentored 75 students over the last three years uh, in these projects in, in the um, university archives, but also in the academy uh, ones and in the legacy center. So, um, and, and all produced books and collaborative books. So, uh, but the SRAM was first and it was a really great way to start the project and it's still, um, you know, it's gonna keep moving on. Great. Awesome, well, thank you all so much for coming. And uh, this concludes our session. Have a wonderful rest of your days.